Hi, it's Robin. In early March 2021, Lou Audens, the inventor, or rather project leader, responsible for the compact cassette, passed away. In response, Tecmoan made an excellent video about the history of the compact cassette tape. Towards the end of the video, he mentioned that cassettes use for data often gets overlooked, and he's right about that. Most of my viewers probably know that compact cassette was a very popular format for personal computers in the UK, but what I think really gets overlooked is how common cassette was here in Canada and for our nearby neighbours in the USA from the 1970s through much of the first half of the 1980s. It's often said that only disc was popular in North America, but really it was a transition from cassette to disc as people could afford it. The reason I care about this subject is that from the first experiences I had with personal computers, the Commodore PET at school, and then my first ever computer, the Timex Sinclair 1000, and even when I bought a Commodore 64 in March of 1984, I used cassette storage. And I wasn't alone. So this video is going to be a bit of a history lesson about this seemingly forgotten era of personal computer use in North America. I've pulled out many tapes from my collection that were all made and sold here in Canada and the USA, and we'll even look at some magazines and so on to underline that cassette really was very prevalent here for quite a while. When Commodore released the PET 2001 in 1977, a big part of the appeal was that it had the keyboard, computer, monitor, and storage, the tape drive, all in one unit. And there is no doubt that cassette would be the dominant format for much of the Commodore PET's life. These PETs with the built-in cassette deck still included a cassette port for a second cassette drive, which was device number two. And while they provide a hookup for a disk drive, it actually didn't work on these early models. Disk drives didn't ship until later, and there was actually a bug that required a ROM upgrade to allow disk access on these early PETs. And just in the last year or so, I picked up an original Commodore data set. The box is pretty crusty looking. And here it is. Commodore actually released many variations of their data cassette, but they're all compatible with each other using the same connector right from the PET, VIC-20, Commodore 64, and even the Commodore 128 has this same connector on it. Chuck Hutchins made an awesome video about all the different data set variations. Check the video description for a link to that video. So looking at some PET software on cassette, given to me by my math teacher from high school when he was really into the Commodore PET. Here we've got Cursor Cassette Magazine, and here's issue number one from July 1978. And you would subscribe, and every month they would send you programs on cassette. Often games, but other programs as well. And issue 15 from November, December 79, features Dungeon, one of my all-time favorite pet games. I made an episode just about that one a while ago. As far as I know, there wasn't a disc version of Cursor. So in these early days of the pet, cassette was the way to distribute software. And there were other commercial startups here. Software would often ship just in a plastic package like this with an insert. Check out that. It's the Power Bite guy. He's obviously got a pet computer for a head and torso. And this exciting title is Cash Flow Model. But there's also more professionally packaged software, such as these very big box games from the Avalon Hill Game Company. That's... Guns of Fort Defiance. So I have quite a few games from them. Great big instruction sheet. Just give you a look at one. And here's the cassette game. And this one cassette includes versions for the Atari 800, Apple II, PET 2001, and TRS-80. Copyright 1981. Other titles include Galaxy, Conflict 2500, Arcade Pack 4, Road Racer Bowler. Got pet screenshots on the back there. 
and five card draw poker, which they point out also works on the Commodore 64. If you type control two, turn the cursor white before loading the game. So you see that the pet had decent commercial software support on cassette. And in 1977, Radio Shack also entered the personal computer market with their first TRS-80, what went on to be called the Model 1. Unfortunately, I don't have one of those. This is a much later unit that was decked out with dual disk drives from around 1984, actually. But Radio Shack did sell lower-end models as late as 1983 without disk drive. And here in the January 1983 issue of Electronic Fun with Computers and Video Games is a review of the TRS-80. And right here it mentions the basic Model 3 sells for $1,000. It comes with a cassette drive operable at either 500 or 1500 baud, that is bits per second, 16K of memory and a parallel printer. So here's a computer being reviewed in 1983 that comes standard with a cassette drive in North America. And here's the Radio Shack TRS-80 color computer, which came to be known as the Coco One, because there are another two color computers made afterwards. Now I have a fair bit of software on cartridge, but there was also software published on cassette, and it used Radio Shack's standard 5-pin connector breakout cable to the audio cables. And here's one of Radio Shack's TRS-80 computer cassette recorders, this one is the CCR81, DC 5 volts, ear, auxiliary, remote, that could be used so that the computer could pause or start the playing on its own, and the microphone. It certainly wasn't a big success, but the TRS-80 MC10 microcolor computer never offered disk support either, as far as I know, but does have the standard Radio Shack 5-pin cassette port. Another Radio Shack machine is the TRS-80 Model 100. I showed this in an Easter egg video a while ago, and you see it proudly has a cassette port on the back, which was used for backing up the contents of the 32K of battery-backed RAM in the machine. Radio Shack's line of pocket computers, which I've shown in a previous video, also used cassette. Here's the pocket computer cassette interface. There's the interface. Here goes in here. It's like a dock. And it provides the cable for the cassette. Here's a game called Pyramid. And that's actually for Color Basic, for the color computer from 1982. And here's a number of TRS-80 branded cassettes, even if they're actually just blanks. This one is Talking Eliza, Artificial Intelligence Simulation for the 16K Level 1 Basic, and that's from 1979. Avalon Hill also supported the TRS-80 with games like Acquire High Adventure in the World of High Finance. This is a cool one. Voyager 1, Sabotage of the Robot Ship. And the included screenshots are from the TRS-80 version, but it does also support Apple, Atari, and Pet. Computer Stocks and Bonds. <laughs> no screenshot. Arcade Pack number 5, Tank Arcade. With a K. That's for the VIC-20 Atari 400-800 TRS-80 and the PET. Copyright 1982. And finally, Nuke War, computer simulation game. And that supported the C64, Atari 4-8-1200, VIC-20, and TRS-80. That was copyright 1983. The famous Apple II line also had cassette support. But unfortunately, I don't have any of those earlier Apple II, Apple IIe. Notably, this Apple IIc from 1984 got rid of the cassette port. And Apple really was one of the North American manufacturers who most rapidly moved away from cassette onto disc, and perhaps that's part of why North America's cassette phase is forgotten. But nevertheless, the Apple II did have some strong cassette support in the early years. Here's high-resolution graphics. This one's really cool. 
Here on one side is an unlicensed Star Wars game, copyright 1978, Apple Computer Inc. And do you know what's on the back side? Unlicensed Star Trek. <laughs> so how cool is that? Star Wars and Star Trek on one Apple branded cassette. And I got a bunch of other titles here. Renumber, Append, Penny Arcade. 1979, Brian's Theme, Hopalong Cassidy, 79, Little Brick Out, and Breakout. And Apple also saw support from Avalon Hill. Games like Planet Miners, Arcade Pack number three is Bomber Attack, which actually has an Apple screenshot on the back. Computer Baseball Strategy from 1982. This program will run on Apple II or II Plus, Atari 400-800, Commodore PET CBM, or the TRS-80, but they include an Apple screenshot. Here's arcade pack number one, Shootout at the OK Galaxy, with screenshots from Atari, Apple, PET, TRS-80, and the color or Coco TRS-80. That's copyright 1982. And this beautiful beast of a machine is the Exidy Sorcerer from 1979. And while it was possible to get disc for it with the S100 bus, it was extremely expensive. And I don't know how many people ever upgraded their sorcerers to use disc. Here on the back are the mic and ear jacks. And for the Sorcerer, I only have one game. This is Adventure One, Adventure Land for the Sorcerer 16K and it's copyright Scott Adams, 1979. So Scott Adams, this is just when he was starting out, I think, and of course went on to produce a very famous line of text adventure games, really being a pioneer. And he supported the Sorcerer. I think this is super rare. Sorcerer software uses the Kansas City Standard, which is a way of storing data on compact audio cassettes at a data rate of 300 bits per second. It originated in a symposium sponsored by Byte Magazine in 1975 in Kansas City, Missouri. The Texas Instruments TI-994 from 1979 had cassette support, and while their cartridges were more common. There still was some software support. Strangely, that's actually the cassette port. There's a breakout cable that goes from that 9-pin connector to the cassette. Unfortunately, I can't find mine right now. And here's my original Cars and Carcasses 2 Rundown Monsters game. That is part of my car battling collection. That was from Not Polyoptics. Is that game number 11? Games for the TI-99-4, which is this 1979 model, and the 99-4A, which was the more popular revised edition from 1981. Now the Atari computers had loads of cassette support. This 1200XL is a bit of a later model than the original Atari 400 and 800, but they issued a new cassette recorder for it, the Atari 1010, to match the same XL styling. And interestingly, these used the same SIO, serial IO ports and connectors, here's the cable for it, that the Atari disk drives used. Plugging it the back here on the Atari computer. Oh, we'll take a look at some North American tape-based Atari software. Here's a recent acquisition of mine, Baja Buggies by GameStar. Created by Dan Ugrin, copyright 1982. I've got lots of other loose games here. Forest Fire by Artworks. Teacher's Pet. Moonbase I.O. by PDI, copyright 82. Here's an Atari published Space Invaders game from 1980. Galactic Chase, published by Spectrum Computers, copyright 81. Pilot, programming language. Here's Genetic Drift by Broderbund Software. And a number of titles 
Downhill Avalanche Player Missile Generator from the Atari Program Exchange, which was an Atari Program distribution service. So I think a lot of software got distributed on cassette through the APX. I'd like to learn more about that sometime. And Avalon Hill supported the Atari quite a bit. Here's Space Station Zulu. Check out that art. <laughs> That's from 1982. Gypsy. Also from 82. Arcade Pack 7. Thank you, Angela, whoever you were, for writing on there. Legionnaire. Knockout. So all these programs are actually just Atari specific. And Flying Ace, that was from 1983. And here's Commodore's VIC-20, and cassette was the super common format for this, using Commodore's own proprietary cassette decks. Let's look at my collection of software for it. For the VIC-20, there were a number of cartridge releases for it, but besides that, tape was absolutely the dominant format. In fact, as far as I know, the VIC-20 never had any disc releases at all, Back in the 80s, it's only been in recent times that people have been doing VIC disc releases, such as my friend Jeff Daniels, who has these denial collections of games, VIC-20 games he's written, and the excellent Realms of Quest by my friend Jizan, and David Murray's Attack of the Petsky Robots is the most recent VIC-20 disc release. But back in the 80s, the VIC-20 was all about cassette in North America, well, around the world, Here's an Epix game, Ricochet. That's back from when Epix was also called Automated Simulations. They're in Sunnyvale, California. And the Pack-Ins, Summer Catalog of Games. I want to point out how Epix would often include these kind of leaflets here describing how to load from tape. If you have any problems loading this cassette, clean and demagnetize your recorder heads. If the problem persists, then contact Customer service, that was from 1982. And every Epix tape release from back then has these notices. Have you serviced your heads lately? Of the faulty cassette tapes returned to automated simulations, many have been ruined by the heads on our customers' cassette drives. This situation is a problem for you and for us. You could tell that Epix wanted to get rid of the cassette, but they were sort of stuck with it there in the early 80s. UMI games for the VIC-20. This one is Amok, Cosmic Kamikaze, Simon, and Alien Blitz. Here in Canada, we had a lot of games from this Lane Marketing. Copyright 1983 for Zorgon's Kingdom. Here's a Canadian Tire, which is a big retailer here in Canada. They're not just tires, you know. Compliments of Canadian Tire with your new VIC-20. They sold computers. In the 80s, there's Sword of Fargal, Raid on Isram. Many more releases here. Paints and Mutants, Critters, Syntax Software in Willowdale, Ontario. Vic Term, an introduction to Vic Basic, Crush, Crumble, and Chomp by Epix. Many more North American Vic 20 cassette releases. There's Which Way from Regina, Saskatchewan. A few PAL releases snuck in here, the pound 99 range. Okay, ignore those three, but the rest of these are all North American releases. So like I was saying, the Timex Sinclair 1000 was my first computer. It was released in July of 1982 and never did have disk support. It only had cassette support. And that was by these 3.5 millimeter jacks labeled ear and microphone which you just run with audio cables to your cassette deck. This particular one is a stereo deck. I actually found it was more reliable if you had a mono deck, but you use what you had back then. So the Timex Sinclair 1000, the North American version of the ZX81, also never got disc support, so it was cassette only for its entire life here. And this did have a short life, but a lot of people bought them for that first year. It was the first $99 computer. So here's my collection of North American ZX81 or Timex Sinclair 1000 releases. 
ZX Bug is a machine code assembler and disassembler as manufactured and printed in Canada. So that's true of all these titles here ZX Assembler, Pack Rabbit, Mr. Munchie, Roman Empire, copyright 1983, and then all these releases from Timex themselves where they had color coded them green for business, red for entertainment like chess or mixed game bag 2 <laughs> education such as the flight simulator or super math of course many of these titles required the 16k ram expander the stock option analyzer in the blue household category conversational french well and there's the mixed game bag 1 still sealed and here's a bit of an oddity. This is the Starpath Supercharger for the Atari 2600. And it is a giant sized Atari 2600 cartridge that contains, I believe, 6K of RAM. So you plug the giant cartridge into your Atari 2600 like a regular cartridge. And it gives you standard audio cable, which you then plug into your cassette deck. And it opens up a library of cassette games for the Atari 2600, such as Communist Mutants from Space. So this had a couple advantages. Cassettes are cheaper to reproduce than game cartridges. And because the software load from tape into the RAM of the supercharger, that allowed the programmers to do some hacks, so to speak, with self-modifying code and just provided extra RAM for the Atari 2600 so that games could have larger virtual bitmaps and so on. 6K of RAM was a huge improvement over the 128 bytes that the Atari 2600 included. So when I bought my first Commodore 64, that was in March 1984, and I only bought it because the price had just dropped down, I believe, to $199. I thought I was going to buy a VIC-20, and then my parents pointed out that the Commodore 64 wasn't that much more money, and that this was a far superior computer. So I bought a Commodore 64, but I didn't have any money left over, not just for a disk drive, I didn't even have money for a cassette drive. So for the first several weeks, I had no storage at all for my Commodore 64. So within a couple or few months of getting my C64, probably sometime summer 1984, I finally saved up enough money to buy my own data set. And this is the original box. And I bought it for $49.99 Canadian at my local Zeller's store. At that time, they were still very easy to get. And the data set remained my only form of storage for my Commodore 64 all the way until October 1985, when for my birthday, my parents paid for half of a 1541 disk drive. I believe it was $320. I finally was able to use disk. And I want to mention that for the first year of only my Commodore 64, I didn't feel like I was at a major disadvantage having a data set. I don't think I knew anyone with a disk drive for all of 1984. It was easy for me to go to the store and buy games on cassette or blank tapes for more storage. Then, from 1984 going into 1985, cassette releases all but disappeared, and discs were everywhere. I knew I had to buy a 1541. So it's well established that in the UK, C64 had cassette games throughout its life, right into the 1990s. American Tag Team, of course, from the UK. There's the UK release of Bruce Lee, which is a North American-made game. Frantic Freddy, actually Canadian-made. Motor Mania, another American one. Red Max, and DJ Puff here is an excellent late UK-made game. And even nowadays, people are releasing new games such as this one, Exploding Fish. Ooh. But in the first half of the 1980s, cassette was totally a thing for the Commodore 64 here in North America as well. Not just saving your own programs, but actually going to the store and buying them. Here is the first C64 game that I ever bought, Tombs of Cheops. And it's a text adventure game with a real action shot of the game. <laughs> they mean that. It's a text adventure. There's the real action shot of the game, not that. 
Okay, and that was from 1983. And that company kept releasing games, like here's Deflector, and this is copyright 1984. I don't have the case anymore, but this is a game I bought at the KB Toys in Superior, Wisconsin in 1984, or maybe even early 1985, City Attack by KTEL Software, copyright 1984, and lots of other ones. Caverns of Kafka, that caused me, even like a, a word processor for the C64. Copyright 1984, Motor Mania, Falcon Patrol, Hez Paintbrush, Slam Ball, Galaxy, all from 1983-1984. And that Umi Software even released Checkbook for the C64. What a captivating title. Epix was all in with the cassette releases. Here's Crush, Crumble, and Chop, Computer Game of the Year cassette for C64. The famous Sword of Fargle. which was ported from the VIC-20. Temple of Apshai, which I have complete with the manual, which actually came on three cassettes for all the different levels. And the expansion Upper Reaches of Apshai with two more cassettes. Here's the excellent Forbidden Forest, which included both disc and cassette. Two more Avalon Hill sort of educational games here. Intelligence Quest Software, DivX, and Market Forces. And those were both copyright 1984, which included both the C64 and Atari versions on the one cassette. And other companies supported C64 and cassette in North America, such as Advantage Artworks. But this is actually a disc version here. I want to point out that their packaging included space for a cassette. So that was a common sign around 1984 and 1985 to get packaging with a spot for cassette, even as the cassette was being phased out until they used up that packaging. And this May 1983 issue of Electronic Fun, Computer and Games, it gives this review of the Commerce 64. And mentioned down here on page 44 is that for $595, you get a Commodore 64 microcomputer with 64K of RAM, unspectacular but perfectly good PET basic and ROM, and all the interfaces and hookups necessary to add a TV, a cassette drive for $60, a disk drive for $400, a modem, and so on. So I just wanted to point out that even here in North America, the cassette drive was pushed as the inexpensive solution. The cassette drive was $60, the disk drive was $400. Well, that $340 difference was very significant to a lot of purchasers. When I bought my C64 in March 1984, I actually had no storage for it. I didn't even buy the cassette drive. I had to save up to buy the cassette drive and then save up a lot more to buy the disk drive. I often hear people in the UK or Australia say, with shock that the disk drive costs more than the computer. And of course, that's why they never switched to disk. It was too expensive. Well, it was expensive here too. Commodore's vertical integration that allowed them to drop the C64 price from 595 down to 299, 249, and even down to 199 by late 1983 or early 1984 that vertical integration and cost reduction did not apply as strongly to the 1541 disk drive because Commodore did not make the drive mechanism the single most expensive component themselves. So they weren't able to drop the price on the 1541 the same way they could on the C64. When the Commodore 64 price rapidly fell down to $199, the 1541 did not drop down to, say, $150 or $100. It stayed higher. In fact, sometimes it was higher priced than the computer here as well. It shouldn't be a shock that the 1541 is expensive because of the realities of the costs of manufacturing. My friend Jason Compton did some research here in Compute Magazine, so I'll just show you a few things. This is the August 1983 issue, and here's a seller computer outlet. 
And you can see all the games that are available for sale on cassette. That's what the little C means. Lots of cartridges. Infocom got all in with disk support right from the beginning. And here's Synapse Software who released their games on both disk and the cassette versions. And actually they're all $23 there. UMI cassette releases. Automated simulations. Funny that they split that out from Epics, but I think for a while they are doing automated simulations for their strategy and RPG games and Epics for their arcade. And then, oh yeah, they actually put Epics slash automated. Pez software, cassettes, Tronics, cassette releases. So you can see in 1983, cassette was very normalized for the Commodore 64. It was probably the dominant format for a short while. I don't know how I could prove that. But anyway, it was at least neck and neck with disc. This is a year later, August 1984, an ad from the Software Discounters of America. And many games access beachhead tape or disc, neutral zone, artworks, taper disc, batteries included is all disc. Uh, Epics has Jumpman on taper disc, but R is a uh, ROM cartridge, I believe. Temple of Apshai taper disc. So you can see that disc is becoming more common here in later in 1984. Snap, still taper disc. Timeworks, just disc. And perhaps as a sign of the times, uh, again, thanks to Jason for noticing this, stacked disc drives. Here's a question from a reader. Is it safe for me to stack my 1541 disc drives on top of each other? And then just for completeness, Here's one year later again, August 1985. You see discs right on the cover. And basically there's pretty much no sign of cassette anymore. Uh, they're advertising one megabyte disc drives. The C128 is coming along. Yeah, really, there's a disc drive pictured in the Commodore ads. Another late release is this Tomy Tudor from 1983. And here's the box cassette deck for it. Easy to use with your Tomy Tudor to save your pictures, save your games, save your programs. Uses ordinary cassette tape. And that's copyright 1983, the Tomy Corporation in Carson, California. And surprisingly, a whole year after the Commodore 64, Coleco released a computer called the Atom. Now, unfortunately, I don't actually have an Atom, but I do have some blank media for it. High-speed digital data pack stores 256K bytes of data or program. So it's a C down here. It does say a C250 cassette. So one tape was $7.88. Hashtag bring back Zellers. To insert or remove a digital data pack, follow these steps. <laughs> so that was really expensive. I have one Atom cassette here that's been used, and as far as I know, it's exactly like a regular compact cassette, but they deliberately did not punch out the holes for the spindles right in this area where they would normally be. So unfortunately, I don't have an Atom to look at that in more depth, but for whatever reason, Coleco thought it was a good idea to put out a tape-based machine in late 1983 in North America. And even the IBM PC Jr., which released in March of 1984, included cassette support. Now, I don't think they pushed that. I'm not aware of software coming out then. And since I have this adapter cable for cassette, just thought I'd show it. <laughs> All for this one cable, which connects in on the back of the PC Jr. And again, gives you the three plugs for the cassette drive. And in classic IBM style, it even gives you the adapter cable for cassette installation instructions. <laughs> Still sealed, I guess. Didn't need those. And here is my PC Junior. I made a video about it a few months ago. And the cassette adapter plugs in here in this port, helpfully labeled C. Ready to go. In 1984, tape was still a pretty normal thing. I didn't regret buying a tape drive in 1984. But during 1984 into 1985, tape just very quickly disappeared. The software companies 
shifted to disk. And I don't know if they pushed it or the consumers pushed it, but basically North America very rapidly switched to disk use. And no longer could you go buy cassette games at the store. And basically I found I had to get a disk drive if I was going to keep up with Commodore. Okay, I hope that was informative and it sheds a bit of light on this increasingly forgotten piece of computer history. Compact cassette was a big thing in North America for the early personal computer use, even into the Commodore 64 era. But then disk did supplant it while in the UK and perhaps elsewhere, cassette lived on throughout the C64's life. Next time you're on the social media and somebody says the tired old trope, oh, the UK used cassettes and the USA used disc, I hope you'll point out that the early adopters of the Commodore 64 and many other personal computers from that era used cassette in North America. It was available and affordable. Thanks to my patrons for supporting this channel. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.